Hey everybody, Dave here. As you know, we've been fortunate to have built a pretty influential audience over the years. Security leaders across the globe trust us and depend on us every day to deliver the news and analysis they need to do their jobs. And that's also why so many top security companies and hot startups trust us to connect them to the decision makers and influencers to help get the word out about their brand and fill their sales funnels. We've got lots of great sponsorship opportunities that can help you get the word out, too. Just visit thecyberwire.com slash sponsorship to learn more and connect with us. That's thecyberwire.com slash sponsorship. Thanks. NSA and FBI release a detailed report on a GRU toolset. North Korea's Operation Dream Job fishes in Israeli waters. CISA warns of COVID-19 loan relief scams. Malek Ben Salem from Accenture Labs with highlights from their 2020 Security Vision Report. Our guest is Mike Hamilton from CI Security, who clears the air on election security and the shift to absentee status. And crooks are using infection and job loss as retail fish bait. And now, a word from our sponsor, Observe It. With a distributed workforce becoming the new norm, many organizations are forced to learn how to manage mission-critical functions remotely, which brings a unique set of insider threat challenges to the fore. Whether it's careless users, disgruntled employees, or third-party contractors, insiders have access to sensitive data on networks that are likely less secure, introducing new risks to your business. To protect against these new threats, Proofpoint's Observit Insider Threat Management Solution empowers security teams to identify user risk, protect from data exfiltration, and accelerate incident response, so you can better protect your organization from insider risk. Get your free trial at observit.com slash cyberwire. That's observit.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Observit for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by LastPass. LastPass is an award-winning security solution that helps millions of individuals and over 70,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. Businesses can maximize productivity while still maintaining effortless, strong security with LastPass. LastPass can minimize risk and give your IT team a breakthrough integrated single sign-on password management and multi-factor authentication solution. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, August 13th, 2020. The US NSA and FBI this morning released a report on Drovarube malware a hitherto publicly unremarked strain deployed by APT-28, which, of course, is Fancy Bear, Russia's GRU military intelligence service. The report describes Drovarube as a Linux malware toolset consisting of an implant coupled with a kernel module rootkit, a file transfer and port forwarding tool, and a command and control server. When deployed on a victim machine, the Drovarube implant client provides the capability for direct communications with actor-controlled C2 infrastructure, file download and upload capabilities, execution of arbitrary commands as root, and port forwarding of network traffic to other hosts on the network. All of which is, well, a lot. McAfee CTO Steve Grobman commented in an email that Drovarube is a Swiss army knife of capabilities that allows the attacker to perform many different functions— such as stealing files and remote controlling the victim's computer. Drovarube can be detected, but the two agencies warn that, like other advanced rootkits, the malware takes some pains to hide itself, and so it may be overlooked if you're not on the lookout for it. The alert recommends updating to Linux kernel 3.7 or later, which will enable users to take full advantage of kernel signing enforcement. It also encourages administrators to configure systems so they will only load modules that have a valid digital signature. NSA and the Bureau don't say what they think Fancy Bear's objectives are with Drovarube, but they do scowl in the direction of the GRU's interest in election meddling. Fancy Bear's been there before. Still, with a Swiss Army knife, you can do a lot. So why is it called Drovarube, you're probably wondering? 
The word means woodcutter, wood chopper, or wood splitter. In this case, it's the GRU's own name. That's what the hoods back at the aquarium call it. Nice touch, that NSA. You could Americanize the name as rail splitter, but honest Abe's, they're not. Another question. The alert is detailed and specific. You can get it from the NSA press room at nsa.gov, and it's a lively read that really put the G into GRU. Why release it? The authors say, in an accompanying fact, we're sharing this information with our customers and the public to counter the capabilities of the GRU GTSS, an organization which continues to threaten the United States and its allies. We continuously seek to counter their ability to exploit our nation's critical networks and systems. End quote. That seems right to us. It also seems likely that Fort Meade is letting the girls and boys over at the aquarium know that NSA sees right through them, wood chips and all. Fishing for job seekers. The technique and the fishers aren't new, but the target set has shifted a bit. The Jerusalem Post reports that the Israeli Defense Ministry says it detected and stopped a campaign by North Korea's Lazarus Group to gain access to Israeli defense companies. The Lazarus Group used a now-familiar tactic, phishing in LinkedIn with a bogus job offer to targeted employees. Researchers at security firm Clear Sky, where they've given the campaign the appropriate name Operation Dream Job, have details. An approach may be initially made through a fictitious LinkedIn profile, once some contact is established and a degree of rapport achieved, and this is LinkedIn, so the rapport needn't be very strong, the attackers can escalate through other forms of communication, like phone calls and interaction over WeChat. Eventually, a spear phishing email arrives bearing one of a small number of malicious payloads. The fake job offer is an obvious approach, Clear Sky points out, and it's got a fair chance of being effective for several reasons. First, it's likely to draw the victim's attention during a period when employment is uncertain. Anxiety can render the mark more vulnerable to social engineering. And the interactions one expects during recruiting can, as Clear Sky observes, establish a personal connection and induce a false feeling of benefit from the conversation. Employees are also likely to be loath to disclose to their colleagues, and especially to their bosses, that they're considering a new job offer. The less the marks say about the scam, the less likely they are to raise any red flags. Discretion is expected, and the Lazarus Group asks for it. It's useful, for example, if the threat actors can persuade the victim that correspondence is better carried out over their personal email account as opposed to their corporate account. Correspondence conducted this way is likelier to bypass corporate security measures. Once the payload's in and the victim is compromised, the Lazarus Group has two goals, and these are always the same. They want access to corporate networks where they can steal intellectual property, and they want access to financial accounts where they can steal, well, money. The U.S. election continues to heat up, and along with it, there's continuing concern for election security and integrity, especially as more states focus on voting by mail, thanks to safety concerns from the COVID pandemic. Mike Hamilton is founder and CISO at CI Security and former Chief Information Security Officer for the City of Seattle, Washington, where voting by mail has been an option for decades. Our own Chief Analyst and Chief Security Officer Rick Howard got on the line with Mike Hamilton. Here's their conversation. Since I've lived here in Washington State, this is the only way we've done it. And it was surprising at first, uh, but you get your ballot well in advance of the election. In fact, so far in advance of the election, you know, some people um, voted in the presidential primary and uh, when by the time they voted, it was already a done deal. <laughs> and, 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 and they had voted, you know, and they, they voted early and then found out, well, you know, they voted for somebody that lost and then didn't have a chance, you know, to modify that. So, so it takes yeah. a little bit of the drama out of it. But uh, other than that, it's a mm -hmm. secure system. It is. We consider it to be. And, you know, there are a lot of controls in place, you know, starting with how the ballots are printed and, you know, every one of them has a barcode and that barcode is keyed to you. And it also is keyed to a, your signature on file. Those signatures are checked by hand and by machine, right? If, it, if the machine fails, says this doesn't look like a match, it goes to a person, they will check it. And then if they have to pull it out, they'll give you a call. 
Talk to me about that. That sounds fascinating. I've never heard of that before. So you you mm-hmm. assign a barcode to a registered user. To how a ballot, make, yes. To a, how does that, how do we make sure that no one can interfere with that? Well, well, well the barcode is key to you, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, there was, there was a suggestion made recently that other countries could just print phony ballots. And, mm-hmm. and no, they can't. <laughs> they can't do that because it has to be coded to every voter and there has to be a signature match as well and multiple levels of all of these controls being checked for every ballot. Washington State's been doing this for what, 10 years? Is that what you said? Or yeah, since the 80s. Since the 80s. Yeah. So now there are states who have never tried this, mm-hmm. right? And now it's July. Could they get up to speed quickly enough to make this work? I don't know if they didn't, if they, honestly, Rick, if they didn't get in front of this um, a little before now, you know, part of the problem is going to be printing all those ballots with barcodes, establishing a database that has, you know, they already have copies of signatures, probably electronically, but now they've got to be all keyed to a database corresponding to the barcode um, and then have ballots printed that are individual to each voter. And, you know, there's companies that do that, but I think you needed to get into the queue pretty early. So you're anticipating that there's going to be some disagreement about the results of all of these things, regardless of if we do it by mail-in or the way we've always done it. And uh, this might be a prolonged election season. Is that what you're... It, yes, yeah. uh, that is exactly right. I think a lot of people are thinking that too. And so is there anything we can do to head that off, do you think? Well, you know, I think... Um, you know, educating people on exactly the way this works, like you're doing right now, right. Um, I, I think is probably the best thing we can do. But there's just a lot of people that will reject any information that, you know, doesn't fit their kind of preconceived notion of reality. I think you're right, Mike. We live in interesting times. What can I tell you? <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Thank you for giving your insight. And uh, I guess we will see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, Thanks for the conversation, Rick. Thank you, sir. That's the CyberWire's Rick Howard speaking with CI Securities founder and chief information security officer, Mike Hamilton. And finally, as if people didn't have enough trouble without crooks jumping up and down on them when they're down during a pandemic, there are more COVID-19-themed scams out and about. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency warned that an unknown malicious cyber actor is spoofing a U.S. Small Business Administration COVID-19 loan relief site in phishing emails. By these marks shall ye know them. The subject line is SBA application, review and proceed. The sender is disastercustomerservice at sba.gov. Don't go there. There are also phishing expeditions going after individuals, and these are baited with anxiety. So what are people worried about nowadays? A lot of them are worried about getting sick or getting fired. And the crooks, of course, take notice of popular fears. USA Today reports that people are getting spam telling them, hey, you've been infected with COVID-19, and hey, you've also just been fired. If you get one of these, take a deep breath and think about how likely it is that you'd be notified of either infection or firing by email. If you've still got a case of the yips, call your doctor or call your job for quick reassurance. And then pick up the phone and call the Federal Trade Commissioner's Consumer Hotline. Let's stay safe out there. We're all in this together. And now, a word from our sponsor, ThreatConnect. Designed by analysts but built for the entire team, ThreatConnect's intelligence-driven security operations platform is the only solution available today with intelligence, automation, analytics, and workflows in a single platform. Every day, organizations worldwide use ThreatConnect as the center of their security operations to detect, respond, remediate, and automate. With all of your knowledge in one place, enhanced by intelligence, enriched with analytics, driven by workflows, you'll dramatically improve the effectiveness of every member of the team. Want to learn more? Check out their newest ebook, Soar Platforms. Everything you need to know about security, orchestration, automation, and response. The book talks about intelligence driven orchestration, decreasing time to response and remediation with Soar, and ends with a checklist for a complete Soar solution. Download it at threatconnect.com slash cyberwire. That's threatconnect.com slash cyberwire. And we thank ThreatConnect for sponsoring our show.
And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Malek Ben Salem. She is the America's security R&D lead at Accenture Labs. Uh, Malek, it's always great to have you back. Um, uh, you and your team there at Accenture uh, recently uh, came out with a, a publication that we wanted to touch on today uh, about uh, some of your vision going forward for 2020. What are some of the things you wanted to share with us today? Thank you, Dave. Yeah, our security technology vision has focused this year on continuous innovation through emerging technology adoption and how organizations can adopt new technologies uh, and, and do that securely. Uh, so we've surveyed about 500 you know, C-suite executives from companies covering 12 industries, about eight countries. Uh, and these are big companies, so companies that have revenue of $5 billion or more. And uh, the questions we wanted to look at is how can enterprises be at the forefront of technology adoption, driving growth, but doing so securely? Hmm. And, uh, you know, the main findings uh, we've had based on this survey were, were actually surprising. So hmm. we've been able to find that these emerging technologies and the ones we focused on were AI, uh, 5G, quantum, and uh, extended reality, XR. Mm. It seems that these technologies pose a major paradigm shift in security challenges. We found that the respondents to our survey believe that AI, the most implemented emerging technology to date, uh, as indicated in our study, was perceived as the most significant security risk so 45% of our survey respondents um, believe that AI posed a significant security risk, uh, but less so with the other technologies. So for 5G, 5G it was 31% only who believed uh, you know, it, it poses a security risk. Quantum computing only 28% and XR only 21%. So um, this was surprising to us. So it seems that there is, a, you know, some uh, lack of uh, understanding or some underestimation of the security risk that these emerging technologies pose to uh, to organizations. Now, there were some other interesting things you got uh, from your results here. What else can you share with us? Yeah, so uh, we continue basically with the theme of underestimation uh, in our second finding. We found that C-suite executives underrate the extent and timing of what they need to do to secure these technologies. So when we asked about how, what do you plan on doing to, you know, to secure AI or 5G, et cetera, you know, these executives answer had several strategies in mind. So they thought about training existing employees. 77% of them um, uh, thought so. They thought about collaborating uh, or partnering with organizations that have expertise. 73% hiring new talent. 73% acquiring new business or startups. 49%. But when we asked whether they started planning to secure these technologies, only 55% said so uh, that they are actively planning to secure AI. Um, only 36% mentioned that they started planning for 5G, 32% uh, for XR, and 29% for quantum. Hmm. So while these executives are thinking about various strategies to secure these emerging technologies in the long run, it seems that they're underestimating how long it takes to do that, how long it takes to secure these technologies, we know that just you know bringing people on board and teaching them these technologies, these innovative technologies itself takes time, let alone teaching security professionals how to secure these technologies. That takes even longer, right? While, while courses exist and Coursera or you know, online learning platforms, we know that it takes much more to gain basic proficiency in securing an emerging technology. So hmm. we urge uh, you know, these executives to start thinking about security now as they're adopting these emerging technologies. Yeah, interesting indeed. 
All right. Well, Malek Ben Salem, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dave. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for Cyberwire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the Cyberwire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Proofpoints Observit, the leading people centric insider threat management solution. Learn more at observit.com. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow.